Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So let's hope that today we get this through without any more fire exercises. Um, any questions about anything that's on your mind? Kit or the homework or... Okay, so then I'm going to try to rush through what we've been trying to do last time and get you to the point where you can do the next homework over the, the long weekend because um, you'll probably need need a couple of tries to, to get to where I want you to be. So the, <clears throat> the point of this chapter here is to get, get you going with a process for applying object-oriented design and for learning some of the essential tools that w one is using. So if, when you come out of 46A, 46B, you've written small programs, maybe you know, two or three or four classes, and uh, so what you th should think about is what this is all about is what if, if you have a, a task to solve that is so large that it's not going to be doable with just you know, two or three or four classes or a few hundred lines of code, but you might need dozens or hundreds of classes to, uh, uh, to get it to work. Um, how do you do that? And so I'm going to skip past this stuff here that... And the, the first challenge that you typically have is you have some kind of a problem that you want to solve and um, you now need to find out, well, what classes do I use? In 46A and B, that was really easy because the professor told you implement a class student that has these methods and then you did that and it passed the tester and you moved on with your life. But in real life, of course, no one is going to tell you that, right? The, Business people are going to bring you some requirements, and they're going to say, when can I have it? And then it's your job to find out how to solve this by identifying what classes you need to implement. So um, the <clears throat> this chapter here uses as its running example a really, really old-fashioned voicemail system. And that's actually is a good example, even though you're never going to code up another one of these. Um, but it, it just has a, a lot of the, the attributes that you, that you want from a kind of a problem that's complex enough that it, there's not an obvious solution, but still simple enough that you can wrap your head around it in, uh, <clears throat> in a couple of hours. So in that voicemail system there, it talks about a user dialing up, you know, the old fashioned way when you dialed up a phone and it says you have reached um, the voicemail of whoever um, and then if you reach your own voicemail, you can dial some key and retrieve your messages and so on. You know, nowadays, of course, your messages get transcribed automatically by Google and you look at them on, on, on the Google Voice or whatever. Um, but in the olden days, that's not how it was. So when you read through the description of that thing, it says you know, a user dials an extension. And then they get one of these menus where it says, you know, press two to listen to your messages, press three, to change a passcode or whatever. And so the, the rule of thumb is you, you get one of these descriptions of how the system should behave. And when it talks about messages and mailboxes and users and passcodes and all of that, then those are potentially good candidates for classes. So you should ask yourself, would mailbox make a good class? Would message make a good class? Would passcode make a good class? And all of that. And so <clears throat> um, w when you look at classes, you want to do that at a higher level than you maybe did in 46B. So for example, we, w when we say, well, these messages in a voicemail system, they kind of queue up. You listen to a message, then you listen to another message, and then to the next one, and so on. So conceptually, a message queue you know, is some storage for messages where you can uh, listen to them one at a time. And so we would say we'll have a me class message queue that conceptually describes that. But we're not really that interested at this point as to how they implement. So when you do the design of these classes, the uh, assumption is that you know enough computer science that you know that there is an implementation for a queue, there's many implementations for queues, and later on some implementor, you know, in some foreign country, wherever you ship that part out to, you know, can, can do the nitty-gritty implementation. But we're on a higher level. We are architects and designers. 
and we say, yes, we want such a class, we want to specify what it needs to do, but we're not really worried about the implementation. So that's quite, quite a different focus. Um, <clears throat> it's mildly useful to think about that there are different categories of classes. When you build a system, uh, a, you know, a complex system of, uh, that actually does uh, things, there are the kinds of classes that describe what goes on in the real world that are called tangible things here like you know, a mailbox and a user, and I don't know how tangible they are, but they describe these real world entities, and so they make it uh, a good first thing that you want to model. But as you will see um, <clears throat> later throughout this entire course, there's all these other classes that are used for making machinery work up. So you might have classes that model events or transactions, or <clears throat> agents that do certain things. Um, <clears throat> you might have classes that are at, at a very high level, at, at a system level. So we might have a mail system that kind of does everything, but hopefully it's composed of many other classes, because otherwise you, know, you would only have one class, and that wouldn't really work out. Um, and then the you know, foundational classes, such as you know, the math and string and date classes, that kind of, kind of stuff. And so typically when you build a system, you need to have all these different classes um, <coughs> uh, to uh, put together um, to get that to work. So, like, when you look at an assignment, by the end of the semester, you'll be probably be making a project that has maybe 10, 15 collaborating classes. When you look at uh, a typical software engineering, a 160 pro a project, it probably has, you know, twice to three times as many. When you look at a professional program, I mean, it'll have hundreds of classes that, it, that it's made up. Uh, so if you look, for example, how many classes were used to make the Eclipse framework that you're using for text editing, you know, that's several hundred classes, easily. So when you have a class, or when you have an idea of what would be a good class, then you kind of usually have a fuzzy idea of what it should be. Think of the class mailbox. You probably have an idea that a mailbox in some way has messages inside. Or think of a class user. You know, a user has a name and a pass password maybe. but <clears throat> then the next level in the, uh, in the design is you, you want to become very specific about when you have one of these classes, what is that class responsible for? And so with a message queue, for example, um, a message queue has pretty well-defined responsibility because we understand what a queue does. When you have a message queue, you want to add a message to it. You want to remove a message from it. You might, yeah. Uh, why would we need a message queue as long as we have a mailbox already? That's a good question. Um, and so it, it, in this particular uh, design, uh, it, it was a natural thing that came out of the user interface for this voicemail system. So in a voicemail system, it's not like when you, when you look at your email, you see a list of all of the messages. But in a, in a voicemail system where all you can do is listen to them on the phone, you really get them one by one. And so it says, what's your first message? What's this, you know, and then, then what do you do with that message? You can't really scroll, but it gets played to you, and then you have to make a decision. Do you want to keep it, which puts it back at the end of the queue, or do you want to discard it? Yeah. So is that an uh, independent um, class? I mean, um, actually, we can also put like, um, like the array or whatever. Or yes, so when I say message queue, I'm not saying this must be a uh, java.util.bounded queue or whatever. I'm saying it behaves conceptually like a queue. There's something where the message is the queue up and when you're done with the message, it's gone except if you want to put it back at the end. So I'm not saying it's like a queue data structure. It's just conceptually like a queue of things. Um, that's, that's what I was trying to say if, if you decide to go that at this point we're thinking about them at a high level. I'm not saying there must be a queue inside. So if there could be an array inside or it could be a gigantic string inside with all of the messages concatenated, or it could be in a file or whatever. Um, I'm interested in what is the behavior at a higher level than at an implementation level. So <clears throat> um, you identify these responsibilities, and how do you find out what responsibilities you should even consider? So again, think of the that when you start out very early with this with this process. 
the business people give you a functional specification that says this system should be able to do this, should be able to do that, and you've never built a system like that before, so you have no idea what might be good classes, but you kind of say, okay, this looks like something that intuitively might make a good class, and you don't really know what might make good responsibilities. So the first rule of thumb is that you, know, you look for, for verbs in the problem description. The problem description will say um, the user wants to keep the message, the user wants to discard the message, the user wants to, to add a, a, a message. Um, and so those might make good, good responsibilities and you kind of note them down and, and think about that. So in, in OO, this is actually kind of helpful for this design. We always think of a responsibility or when you code it up in, uh, as a method, it always belongs to a single class. So you know, we have this, this thing that says that when you have a method, say add, that method must belong to a class. And then when it is in a class, then you use it in this, this peculiar way, you say add. Then there's a dot to the left and parentheses to the right. And now you need to put an object here you need to put an object inside the parentheses. So, now this example that I have here, so we want to add a message to a mailbox. Well, do I say message dot add of mailbox? Or do I say mailbox dot add of message? Now in this case, that's not a hard question to answer, right? Presumably it's the mailbox whose job it is to somehow collect those messages. But we'll see soon that when we get to classes that are less intuitive, that this is a serious question. And you will ask yourself that question in the homework where you're going to be dealing with a few classes that seem to be kind of arbitrary and where these decisions actually later drive quite a bit what goes on in the implementation. So you have this principle of responsibility that you have something that needs to get done. And in, in, in object-oriented programming, we believe there is a single object of a particular class that is the responsible one for carrying it up. So we would say it's the mailbox that really is responsible. The mailbox needs to make sure that message gets stuck in the right place. The message is just a uh, passive bystander here. It doesn't know how, where other messages are. So, we've talked about identifying classes, identifying responsibilities, and the third thing that one wants to do when one starts out with an object-oriented design is we want to identify relationships between classes. And so why do we want to do that? Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, when you look at these class relationships, they usually tell you something about the design and they uh, give you a first way of judging whether the design is good or bad. And the trouble when you design uh, a set of classes is that there's many ways of doing it. It's not a scientific process. Um, there's, there's no one right answer. And oftentimes, one wants to find out uh, which of two competing designs is, is better in some way, which is more maintainable, which is clearer. And of course, one way of finding that out is you hire two teams of implementors, and you have them implement them both. But realistically, that's not feasible, right? You can't always do that. And but it often turns out that if you have a poor design, that you're really hurting later when you need to implement it. So identifying poor designs early before it comes to implementation, or identifying good designs early, is 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 really helpful. So one way of getting at that is to do some visualization of these relationships. So there are three relationships that one typically tracks called dependency, aggregation, and inheritance. And they have these nifty nicknames, uses, has, and is. So let's just look at an example so it doesn't get incredibly abstract. So <clears throat> the dependency relationship is actually the most useful one of, of those, even though the other ones are conceptually easier to understand. So let me start with the first ones. So, <clears throat> um, and I'll give you this mailbox message example. So we have a class mailbox, and we have a class message. 
as such. And there's a graph for those uh, uh, notation that one uses all the time, so I'm just going to give it to you. Um, and so we're going to say that the mailbox class depends on the message class. And th that is to understand what mailboxes do. You must know about the message class. And you can see that here because the mailbox has a method called adding or has a responsibility called adding that has to deal with messages. So the mailbox cannot be done without messages. Conversely, the message class does not depend on the mailbox class. The message class, what might the message class do? It probably is able to display itself in a certain way. It can tell you who is the sender, who is the recipient, what's the body of the message, when was it sent, those kinds of things. But the message class doesn't really care how it is, it, how multiple messengers are saved or transmitted or anything. It does not care about any of that. So the message class has, when you look at, <coughs> at its responsibilities, none of them say anything about the mailbox. Well, it depends, of course, how one set it up. If someone said that one of the responsibilities of the message is to say, give me the next message that comes after you, which might be how someone designed it, then how can that be solved? Then the message must know with which other messages it is stored, and then it would be different. So um, it's, it's confusing when you do this at first, because there never is one right answer. So if I say, true or false, the message class depends on the mailbox class, it really depends on the entry class. But it's a really interesting question to answer. Um, and one of the reasons that we want to uh, that we want to study this is we want to have a minimum number of dependencies. Generally, dependencies are bad. And there's a pragmatic reason for that. If the message class does not depend on the mailbox class, then that's a good thing. If the mailbox class changes, then the message class doesn't have to know about it because it doesn't depend on that class. It also means I can give the mail the, the, the mail sorry, I can give the message class to someone early on in the project and let them just finish it. And then it's just done and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Whereas the mailbox class can only really get started when the message class exists in some form. So if I have lots of classes that don't depend on other classes, then I can front load the implementation by having some of these easy classes done while we're still struggling with some of the other details. And that's great. So dependencies are generally something that, that we want to avoid. The thing that we particularly do not like, even though it sometimes happens, is when two classes depend on each other. If something like that were to happen, then it probably means that I'm going to have to give those to the same implement or have that person struggle with both of them. And if too many classes depend on too many other classes, you have this big cluster of inter interdependent classes, then you know, poor Fred, when he has to implement them all, you know, he's not going to be able to do anything else. And so simply from a management point of view, you don't really like that. So as an example, um, look at the message class. There must be something in the message class where the message can display the message tags. One would imagine. And so one way of doing that, I should say, the message has a responsibility. Print yourself. And then think of how the implementation would go. It would have message.print, and it would say system.printon, the sender since system.printon, the recipient, the date, and the body. But if you set it up like that, now the message class is coupled with another class. So if print really contains system out of out print on, then now the message class is coupled with which class? <coughs> so let me say this slow more. So let's say the implementation of print says system out print on the body. Then out of a sudden now the message class has Dependency on which class? System. System, absolutely. And print stream, excellent. Because 
because system.out is a print screen. So all of a sudden you have these two dependencies, and they're pretty nasty dependencies. Do you think this thing here has a system.out? It probably does somewhere, right? For so that when when you log into it through uh, through the USB debugging connection. Do you think your toaster oven has a system.out? So system.out is something that doesn't exist everywhere when you have a graphical user interface. This doesn't make any sense. So out of a sudden, the message class that's designed in this way can no longer be used when you move your application into a graphical user interface. So it's, uh, there is an easy remedy, and that's to say, well, let's just not have the message be responsible for printing itself. Let's change the responsibility a little bit and just have the message reveal the text. And then how that is printed or saved or displayed you know, that's someone else's responsibility. And so by making these kind of changes, one can often improve a design point. All right, so that's the dependency relationship. Remember this three relationship? <coughs> Uses, that's dependency. Has, that's the next one, the aggregation. So we want to know whether one object was, uh, contains or manages in some way uh, a bunch of other objects. And so as a really easy example, the message queue class aggregates messages. There's a bunch of messages that are being managed by the mailbox. As it happens in the design that you'll see later, the mailbox class has two message queues. It has a queue of the new messages that have not yet been read, and it has a separate queue of the old messages that have already been read. So normally, the way aggregation is implemented is just by instance fields. So the message <coughs> class will, sorry, the message queue class will have a, an actual queue or a linked list or an array list or whatever of messages. The mailbox will probably have two instance variables, one called new messages and one called old messages or some such thing. So anytime that you have instance variables, that gives you a clue that aggregation is going on. But remember, we don't yet have the instance variables. We have not yet implemented the class. We're going to implement the class later, and we want to understand what is going to be needed for the implementation. So we want to find out as much as we can about those classes that we don't yet know what they are as we're designing the system. And you can usually tell that aggregation is necessary. So you can tell that a mailbox just is going to just have to hold messages. And so then we would actually make And that's stronger than dependency. <coughs> of course, when the mailbox collects messages, it also depends on messages, but it's a stronger relationship. The mailbox actually manages those messages. Now exactly how they manage it, is it through an array list or an instance variable, or does it actually store them in some file that has a, has a variable, like a file name inside? We don't really care about that. What we care to capture at this point is which objects collect objects of other classes. And <clears throat> one likes to, when one does that capturing, one likes to think about how many, what, what is the multiplicity of this. So if you have a mailbox, you can have any number of messages. So we say it's a one-to-end relationship and write it like this little one or an asterisk. If you have a user, um, which we don't have in this system, but we will in the homework, in the whole system, there'll be a user, and a user has a mailbox. And in that system, as it happens, a user will have exactly one mailbox. And that's useful information to think about during the design, because if you had a user with multiple mailboxes, that would really greatly change how the entire uh, user, how the entire uh, <coughs> design interface is going to be. So the third relationship is, is inheritance. And I'm not going to say too much about it right now because we're going to be looking at it in great detail later. So inheritance is what's called the is a relationship. Um, and so if you've already taken 46A, 46B, you will have seen a little bit about inheritance. And they will have made a great deal out of it in saying, you know, inheritance is like the cornerstone, cornerstone of object-oriented programming. Right? You have a class, and then you can change 
some aspects of that class in some way by making it more <coughs> specialized, more powerful. So for example, one could have a user, and then you could have like a super user who has special privileges. Um, <coughs> we will later see that we will use inheritance to, to mess with messages. So there'll be a regular old message, but then I'll make a different message that goes away after you've read it. Um, like your use messaging systems that have that feature. So we would say that a disappearing message is just like a message, except it also has a recipient, it has a sender, it has a date, it has uh, a body and stuff. But it has this other feature that makes it more special. So this kind of specialization is, is called inheritance, and we're going to be getting into that pretty soon. Now, um, if you've had um, an instructor in 46A or 46B who told you that you know, the principles of object-oriented programming are you know, classes, inheritance, and polymorphism. Um, that's true, except in, from a design perspective, it turns out not to be very useful. Because inheritance, when it is there, it is useful, but it's not very common. The, the most common relationship is dependency, and we're very interested in tracking dependency because it tells us about complexity. Aggregation is pretty common. Inheritance is pretty rare. So the book now makes uh, a fair amount of pages on these use cases. So the idea here is that I, I wanted, in, when I first wrote this book, I wanted to give like a mini methodology that would allow a third semester student to take you know, some problem of moderate complexity and go from the problem description through the design to the implementation. And so now that I'm revisiting this, I decided that I probably don't want to spend a lot of time on the analysis part. Um, that because that's something that you're later going to be seeing in, in, in a course like CS 160 in, in great detail. So we're going to assume that there is someone who already knows how to do these things, who can uh, take, uh, who can interface with you know, carbon life forms from the world of business and customers, and can capture what their requirements are and turn them into the, the kind of things that are a starting point for you. So, but the, the common starting point that you will see um, when you are a, a designer are these use cases. So I'm not gonna ex focus on what makes a good use case, how to write, how to write a good use case, but I'm just, I'm just gonna you know, say, here are some use cases, and they're pretty self-explanatory. So here's a good use case. So this is a use case for leaving a message. And it simply gives a step-by-step -step description of what does the user of the system do, what does the system do, what does the user then do, what does the system do, what does the user do, if the user does something else, and then the system does something else. So um, <coughs> these use cases are actually surprisingly difficult to write and to organize, but we're just going to work on the assumption that someone has done that work and we have it easy for them. And I think from, well, when you take it from there, they're self-explanatory. I actually, in the first draft of homework two, I had you write a couple of use cases, and then I thought of poor old me who would have to grade them, and took that. Oftentimes, in use cases, you'll find these variations that deal with abnormal behavior. So here I have a variation in this use case where the user wants to connect to someone in the, in the voicemail system, but enters an invalid extension number. And then here we have one where the caller hangs up instead of leaving a message. And then one wants to know what should happen in those cases. So you should take the attitude right now that someone will have told you what happened in these cases, or if not, you should seek clarification. Don't make your own decisions. You know, look, look for the answer or, or ask if it's not totally clear. This will happen in the next homework with, and there'll be a simple, this, this other kind of messaging system. And I'm sure there are all sorts of cases that I did not think about. And then you, when you encounter those in your design, you should just ask and say what comes with that. And then we'll jointly clarify. So, um, again, we're gonna be working on the assumption that someone has given us a beautiful set of use cases, someone who knows how to, how to do this. And so now we have a description of the system that we wanna make. So we're, we're not in, in the business right now as, as, as designers to, to question 
what does the customer want, what do the salespeople want. Let us give it to us in a standard script. Um, <clears throat> and later when you take 160, you can, like I say, you can learn how to do a better job generating these descriptions in the code. But now we have the description, and now we have to start coding. Well, we can't code yet because we don't know what to code. So we first want to find out how do we break down this thing that has nothing to do with software. That's just a description of a system and how it should act that we don't really understand yet, um, how, how to implement. H how do we start layering and breaking it down? And so there's a bunch of methods to do that. Um, and uh, one of the ones that are a little bit more systematic, and they're actually not bad, for, particularly for students. And so I'm going to... Uh, so we're going to be trying that out a little bit. We're going to be having a lab about that next Tuesday. Are these CRC cards? So a CRC card is a plain old index card. Here I have one. Uh, yeah, this is the boring old index card, paper card, where one writes down in pencil the name of the class that one thinks one wants to use to help implement the system that we don't know how to implement. And then one writes here the various responsibilities that came up. And that can be, you know, one, one usually has a bunch of passes through it. So here it says manage task or whatever that one is, right? That's a somewhat, someone's best get at first. And one says, oh, the mailbox must somehow be responsible for these tasks. And one also writes them on the right-hand side. And there are different ways of doing this. So the style that's used here is that the left-hand column and the right-hand column are independent of each other. On the left-hand side, you list all of the responsibilities that you can have. On the right-hand side, you list all of the collaborating classes, the dependent classes, that you know have to somehow be around for the store. So for a mailbox to keep these new and safe messages, it needs a message queue. I guess a mailbox also needs messages, so I should write the class message here. And remember, the list over here and the list over there are independent. It might be a good idea to draw up a vertical line over here so that people don't think that that managed passcode has anything to do with the message queue, which it does. Some people actually try to make it so that the, the collaborator is next to the responsibility. So they would move this thing over here. What's the problem with that approach? So some people are very careful about where they write the collaborator. See, I've just wrote it up, up in top here. And, but some people would say, well, you should write it in the third row because the message queue has to do with new and safe message queue. No, that's the question. The question is, why, can, why is that no good? Oh. Would you need to put the message queue? To put the word message queue over here. What's your opinion on that? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so let's think of some other things that a, a mailbox might be responsible for. So a mailbox might be responsible for, and I wish I could just write this, but I think that would be crap. So just imagine you write. Uh, it might say, get new, uh, get next message. It might be responsible for delete current message. So let's say I'm writing here, get next message. What would I, what would I write next to yes, the collaborator? I would say, here, get the next message, what class would I put here? Um, maybe. Let's say message queue. I'll, I'll work with you. So at this point, then I have message queue here and message queue here. So I would have written it twice. So I would have written it twice. But we don't like the root. So that's the root. So the reason that I don't like to like match these things up in this fine-grained way is it just m makes more work. So the whole point of these CRC cards is that they, they're supposed to be, they're, they're a short-lived thing. You just do this for an afternoon or a few days until you have a good design. You don't want to have to be a lot of drudgery. I've seen people who actually 
put those on PowerPoint slides or something great. And that is totally the wrong approach because it takes you know, real time to do. Um, so they're supposed to be pencil and paper, the less writing the better. Um, the reason to have them these physical cards is that sometimes people, when they have a complicated scenario, you have like four or five or six different classes, and you have like a, a mailbox and a message queue, and you have a connection, and you have something else on the other side. Um, and as people design complicated systems, where stuff needs to get transported from one corner of the internet to the other, you will have uh, all sorts of conduits and whatnot. And, yet, and you, have, you might have a class that has conduit, and no one knows what the heck a conduit is supposed to do. And then people will actually line up these cards, and then they will say, well, now let's see, we want to get an order from here through this conduit to the mailbox, to the order queue or whatever, and they'll physically move the card through and see if they have responsibilities assigned everywhere. It's hard to imagine when, until you've done that, but having these physical cards does actually make a certain amount of sense. Yeah? Why would you have to write it? Because I didn't write it up yet. It's just an in. Uh, <coughs> uh, so this is just some, a work in progress, just to show what the, what the layout is. So the idea of these, these CRC cards is that they are a way of, of cracking the nut at first. Now how can I break down my system into some sense of set, set of responsibilities? Do you, you come up with some classes, you come up with some responsibilities, and then you look at the various use cases and say, can I do this? Can one actually carry out this use case with this information? And I'll just have you have, uh, have to run you through an example so that you can see what works and what doesn't work. So <clears throat> what one likes to do is to have the responsibilities and these cards at as high level as reasonably possible without being completely vague and that's a skill that comes over time. Um, some people say one to three responsibilities per card, and some people say you know, three to five or whatever. Um, but I've seen cards that you know, there's one response after another, after another, after another, and they turned it over and wrote more in the back because they ran out of room. That usually means that that is a class that is so important that you better break it up into smaller classes or you write your responsibilities. Uh, because if you have a class that has 200 methods, you know, that's not something, that, that's going to be a very difficult to maintain thing. The whole idea of object oriented design is to have you know, three uh, small and focused classes. Um, are there any classes with 200 methods? Have you ever seen a class with 200 methods? Oh, I, I mean, I know a class with 200 methods. Um, So let's just look at the Java 8 API. Here's Java lang string. Right, it's method after method after method. So, but that's kind of an unusual class, right? You are never going to write java.lang.string. That's a class that's there as a library class for everyone else. So the classes that you write are quite unlike the classes that you may have seen, um, you know, which is an important observation. So you should have classes that, that have small focuses of responsibility, unless like those utility classes that you might sometimes want to work with. All right. So, um, I'm not going to do one of these walkthroughs right now because I want to get to the point where we can understand our mail system a little bit better. Next, <coughs> these, these diagrams. So um, in the 1980s, there uh, was this phase where object-oriented programming was invented and it was widely seen as a as a solution against everything that ailed software development at the time. So in the 1970s, people uh, built ever larger software projects, and they started failing at, at alarming rates. So it was perfectly normal that you would build something to, say, have a new way to run field operations at the DMV. And they would hire IBM or someone, someone to build it for them. They would then have a staff of several thousand programmers and 10 years later, the system just would never work. 
and th that was a common occurrence. It really was. And so people said, you know, we have the software crisis. We know how to write software, except we don't, it doesn't scale up. At some point, we hit this brick wall where these larger projects just, just will almost always fail. And so the term software engineering was invented in the hope that if you can engineer it, then you know, it'll be better. Um, but um, it was hard for people to, to get past that point. And one of the things that people noticed is that the tools that they had at the time were not very good and that there were no objects and classes around. So the only clustering mechanisms that you had were source files. You could put, put a bunch of functions in one file, a bunch of functions in another file. You would have you know, several thousand source files. But any uh, part of any one of those uh, uh, sources could interact with any of the others. And they often did because the programmers being programmers, you do the first darn thing that comes to your mind to solve the problem of the day. And so the systems became extremely difficult to, to maintain. If one of them changed, then lots of other things had to change. If some data representation changed, it, it uh, became very difficult to track that. And so these systems were just crumble under their own weight. And then these object people came around and said, you're doing it all wrong. You should, instead of having a whole bunch of functions and files, you should build your system out of a collaboration of happy and independent objects. Each of the objects has their own responsibilities. How it manages its internal state is its own damn business, and no one else knows about it. And they all just send messages to each other. And it kind of did enable people to get to the next level of building systems that were an order of magnitude larger than what they could be before. And so because that gave them this boost of productivity, this extra level of, of, <coughs> of abstraction, there were people at the time who said, well, we can now solve the software crisis. We'll just make this recipe on how all software should be developed. And so they had these processes and they had notations uh, for all of the design diagrams that one should do, that one generates during these processes. And um, there were a bunch of different notations and then that was bad for business, and so they went. Uh, the the guys who did fairly successful notations um, got all together, founded a company, and just threw everything in there. There's now a couple of dozen or so various diagram types that are standardized, and they're all quite complex. Um, we're just going to take three of those that people actually draw, as opposed to all the others that that are very rare in practice because they turn out not to be all that useful, and so uh, we'll learn how to draw the most basic parts of that. So this whole dream of saying that you should follow this process, you should draw all these diagrams, and then you should gather all of these artifacts, and then the implementation later is just mere child's play and completely automatic. That dream was never fulfilled, and it was naive uh, at the time. Um, and uh, so nowadays, you're not going to have that many people anymore who take two semesters worth of UML um, because it's not, not that practical. But having a base notation where you can go on a whiteboard and quickly jot down a diagram in a notation that everyone else in the world understands is still useful. So even though UML has not lived up to its early promises, the, the basic diagram types have withstood the test of time. So I'll just show you a diagram, uh, a few of these diagrams, and explain the features of them. So these diagrams, <coughs> you often want to draw relations between, between classes. So in a class diagram, you have a box that, that has a class. Simple enough. Here we have a class. If you like, you can take your diagram and put in some of the methods that the class has, or early on in the design phase, the responsibilities, or just as words, you can put them in here. You can also put attributes. That's a bit of a nebulous thing. An attribute could be, it's just anything that you absolutely know that this object must store. So for example, with a user, you could perfectly well say a user has a password. So you would write a box for this user. And then the middle thing here, you would write a password. And that might jog your memory that a user needs to somehow manage their password. So, and one would do that to, uh, because it later helps you to say, well, gosh, the user probably needs an instance variable that says password. Or maybe the user needs to know where the password file is and needs to have you know, both the location of the password file and, and the username so that it can look it up. Um, 
but you would just write it down like that. Now, <clears throat> sometimes you see people who draw these diagrams, they're automated tools that can extract such a diagram from already working code. And so you could have a class that's called string, and then it has 200 methods. And that's terrible and useless, and so you should never use one of those tools. Because the tools don't know which methods are useful and interesting. And they don't know which ones to suppress. And some people try to build tools that can do that, but then it gets so complicated. So the idea of having these diagrams is that you write them on the whiteboard and that they help you discuss some aspects of a complicated system. So far we haven't yet seen complicated systems, so um, they sound maybe a little bit useless, but we're going to be getting into one uh, really soon. Now. So then you have these various arrows. The only arrows that we care about are the first three. <coughs> this is the uses, has, and is. Yes? Would it work to um, reallocate the other digits? Oh, okay. So, um, for example, a, a, so let's, let's have a, a uses relationship that's not a has relationship. So let's say we are designing our new ride share system. And so we're in a new startup under.com. And so we're designing the system. So we have a passenger company. And we have a car class. And so let's say it's still 2016, so we still have a drive. So, does a driver have a car or does a driver use a car? Um, <laughs> so that's a great question now, right? So, who votes for has? Who votes for uses? Yeah, you can, you can be confused. It's a design. So there's no wonderful answer, right? So I would imagine that if I were to build the system, I'd say, you know, I'm not trying to model the world. The world is exists already. I don't have to do a clean one. I'm trying to model some, some system. And in a system, I would imagine that the driver might actually manage that car that it uses to drive the vehicle. So I might be compelled to say, you know, the driver really needs to know where that car is. They might need to replace the car when it's totaled, and that's all. Then we'll let the driver out here to be responsible for it. So the question is not what does the physical driver do, but what does the driver class in the system? What does it do? And that might be a reasonable design decision to say that, you know, we'll have the driver might have an instance variable that's called car, or has the license plate number of the car in there, or something. So it manages where that car is. And one way that that makes sense is probably um, in, in these ride share systems, look at the car. That car has one and only one driver who drives it. Then again, maybe we're told that under actually works completely different. Then under, the people who drive don't own the car, but under owns a bigger car. In that case, that would be a different relationship. Then, you know, the driver would use this car one day and and so it's, there's no right answer. You know, depending on what it is that we're designing, it might be one or the other. Now with the passenger, on the other hand, um, you know, the passenger might use a car, but is that really, uh, when I say passenger use a car, I don't mean the physical passenger. I mean, is there a message in the passenger class that somehow has a parameter of and they may or may not be, right? It really depends on what the system is. Is the passenger class is the interface to you know somewhere out there where there's like a phone screen? Um, that's how phone is set these days. Um, then um, so if the if the conduit to the phone user interface 
really go through message, methods of passenger time, the phone displays, you know, please wait for this call. And so it might be that the passenger actually has a field that says time for a minute call. It might be a zero to one relationship, right? Because the passenger can wait for it. It can't be a minute long call or something. One would wait. So, <clears throat> so here you have a situation where this definitely is not gas, right? The, the car exists outside the passenger, it's not gas. But users might, might or might not be aware. And that the relationship is here, that tells us something. There may be another way of slicing this, that the passenger has no idea what car they're in when it's approaching. Again, I don't mean the real passenger, I mean the passenger possible in any of the systems. So these things are generally hard to, to deal with because we, we don't yet have an implementation. <coughs> that implementation is something that we want to develop. And yet we want to talk about what the likely implementation is going to have to process. So we're giving a talk at SAP. And as, as you'll see when you do this a few times, these things really do drive the implementation. Or later what happens is you try to implement it and someone not really sure. And um, that's very interesting. You learn from that that the next design gets, gets to be better. Um, it's, it's a skill like everything else. Now you might ask a more mundane question, and that is, how come this thing has the arrows here and this thing has that diamond on the other side? And that's just a historical accident because we three people remember they pulled the annotations and threw them all in one big pot, and that's what that's what happened. So we're not going to worry about that too much. So you've seen this multiplicity is I think. Using them quite a bit, you know, one here and a star here. That means one to any number. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you don't have to put them there, but it's often helpful to see them because it gives you a bit of a visual education of what they are. People tend tend to like them. So, <clears throat> um, I don't want to talk about compositions. Uh, we're not going to use it. I'm not going to talk. Th th there's some people. Um, who say you know, aggregation that is already too close to the implementation and they want to have a more general association. And these are the people who don't produce software but diagrams. So I'm not really going to get into that. So we're just going to do has, uses, is, that's, that's easy, and not go into these fine points. Why do I have to put them in the book? Because some of the professors who adopt the book are the kind of people who don't write software but instead write these diagrams. And so that would give me a hard time. All right, so, so the biggest thing about UML is that you draw a diagram not because it's a human urge to draw these diagrams or because it inherently makes you more productive to draw these diagrams. It doesn't. Every diagram has a very real cost and it may not have any benefit. I have spent endless hours of my working life dealing with architects who came in with a whole printout with 30 classes and thousands of connections in between them that, that they would roll out this big plotter paper that they came up with. And then I would have to go through this and say, okay, you have an error from here to here. I don't want to randomly pick these two classes. Explain it. And the architect would look at it. And then he would roll up this paper and come back to me. Um, <clears throat> and so that way you couldn't do any damage. Um, so it's important that that when you draw a UML diagram, you have to draw it because you want to explain a particular point. There's something that's difficult or intricate or weird about the design that you think that the implementer isn't going to understand that without this diagram. Or you're just not sure. You want to ask yourself, can one even do this? Then you draw this diagram, you sketch it out, and you put in just the amount of information that is needed to settle the question that you're discussing. The UML diagrams are not there to try to capture the state of the world. They're very poor for that, even though you know you can easily generate them automatically and stuff. So the diagram has to be there because it, it's necessary for something in the design process. Let's see, do I want to talk about sequence diagrams today? No. So there's two things I want to do. I need to sit down for. <clears throat> One is to just show you this voicemail system that, uh, that I've been talking about, just so that you know what it looks like when you run it.
So this comes in the book code, um, and it just occurred to me that since I'm working on the book, you can download the book code. I, I've given you the download link, but um, <clears throat> I will let me show you where I give you the download link. So over here, when you go to textbook, um, okay, I didn't give you the download link. Um, so I, what what I will do instead is I will put all of this into a Git repo, a public repo, and then you can just, just clone it. And then that way, as I change the code, which I'm bound to do over the next few weeks and months, then you can just refresh it uh, every time. Then you have the latest and greatest. And the more I think about it, I should probably just do that for the chapters as well. But it, this is PDF, so it doesn't much matter. What's that? I'm sorry? Just someone's theory. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So um, that's where the code is. So let's see what. So we have this this mail system here. Um, I've compiled it. Let me run it. And you know, you're not going to be blown away. It's just a toy system. So. Uh, so you should imagine that you're dialing this thing up on a telephone. But to make the programming easier, I didn't do this with, a, with an actual telephone, right? That would have been challenging to do. Um, and I didn't do it with a graphical user interface, although we will put a graphical user interface in front of it, and it'll show something interesting when we do that. So I'm just simulating the phone with a, uh, with a computer. So let's say I want to go to mailbox 13. So I'm typing the one key. Notice I'm just entering one as if I had typed the key. I'm typing the three key, and then I'm typing the pound key each time I hit enter. And it says, you have reached mailbox 13. Please leave a message now. Um, how do I hang up? Uh, oh, I type H. When you type H, that's as if you were hanging up the phone. And now we're back at the at the basic prompt. So now let's say that I am um, the owner of mailbox 13. Then I would go in and say I want to get to mailbox 13. And now I have to type some magic key. I believe it's the pound key. Um, now I have to type my passcode and the pound key. How the heck do I know what's my passcode? Well, this is a super secure system. I think my passcode is the same thing as my number. There. So maybe I should change my passcode, huh? So here it says enter two to change your passcode. So enter a new passcode. So oh, how about thirty-one? I can't remember that. Yeah. And now it says enter one to listen to your messages. And so I type one. And it says to listen to the current message. Okay, whatever. And it doesn't actually speak the message, right? It's just a text program. It prints the message. But you could imagine if you had a text-to-speech synthesizer, you could speak the message. And in fact, of course, what a real program would have to do, what, and those voicemail systems are computers, they, you know, they, they record a text file, just a, a sound file, and then they play it back later. Um, so that's how it goes. And so, uh, so you should run this program and play with it a little bit so that you're familiar with how it works. You know, spend 10 minutes exploring it's not very many nooks and crannies, so that when you read in the in the homework assignment that you're supposed to take, make a system that is similar to this system, that you know what it is that it should be similar to. So that's the first thing that I wanted to show you, and I, I, I'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, okay, Control C gets you out. That's not a feature. Um, the second thing is you're going to be having you're going to have to draw these diagrams, and see where I put this. I did not put this here. I put it in the book. Let me find this from the book.
So, so you're going to have to draw these diagrams in some way. And there are a number of good choices. You could draw them by hand. And that's perfectly fine. And uh, there's nothing wrong with just drawing a diagram by hand and then just taking a camera shot of it and doing that. That's what you will often do when, when you're with colleagues and you just want to discuss some point. And it's something that we will definitely practice. Um, the disadvantage of drawing them by hand is, of course, then if a week later you, you want to discuss it again, then you're going to have to start drawing it from, from scratch. Then. So people do kind of feel the urge to, to have some kind of a diagramming tool. And so there are professional tools. Um, there's a tool um, called Star UML, for example. And you should go ahead and install it. And my reaction when I installed Star UML was, now what? It had like 5 million different widgets and buttons. And then when I tried to do something, it asked me 20 questions that I didn't want to feel like answering. And, um, so I, I thought it was totally overwhelming. Um, Nowadays, there, there are these nifty online tools. Um, so this is one that, that I actually like, um, where you can, like it says, draw a diagram, and we'll draw a class diagram. And so over here, it actually drew one for you, the, this cool class diagram here. It has an order. It has a line item. It has a customer. Now, how did it know what to draw? You put in the instructions up here. So let's say I want to draw a different one, and I'll just leave this open because I don't remember their language. Let's just say I want to be able to say that a mailbox has a message, okay? So I have a mailbox, uh, and then I need to have some kind of an arrow. Um, let's see where we have a similar one. I want to have this kind of arrow, so that they have that one over here. And here you have the mailbox that has a message. Now I can you know, get, get rid of some of this other stuff here. Um, I just kept it around. Let's say I want to have that, that a user uses a mailbox. Um, so I'm guessing my way through here. Is it this arrow? There must be documentation. And now I wanted a dotted arrow. So now it's time to crack open the documentation to find out how to get that arrow. But there's only three arrow types that we care about. So you can use this thing, and it's just fine. You know, at this point, then you can take these things away. Then, then you have the diagram that you want. And then there's some way of, uh, of uh, saving it. Um, you can just share this link here. Now for posterity, I don't know how long they keep it, but you know, for some amount of time. It's available at, at this link for longer than, than anyone needs. So uh, highly recommended, zero learning curve, or a very short learning curve, works like a charm. Um, the other thing that you can do is oh, I have to because it's. Um, you can use this um, this thing that I've written, goodness, almost 20 years ago, um, when the tools that were available were really terrible. And so I'll just show you what you need to do. You download this file. You open the command shell. You go to the downloads directory. Say java-jar. Violet, whatever. There we go. And then you say you want to have a new class diagram. Here it is. And so, okay, I want a class diagram. This kind of looks like a class. Uh, here's another one. I want to have one of these arrows here. So you join the arrows, and then you say this one is, is mailbox. This one is message. 
And that's the end of it. So now we can move this somehow. Oh, that probably wasn't so good. Let's delete it. Um, with this grabber here, you can move the things around. There's, there's a manual uh, at the same site that uh, shows how to do it. Um, and the, the entire manual fits like on this web page. I think, I think you've just seen it. And, and so you can use that thing. You can use star UML if you like, um, if you already used it before and you have experience with it. But I'm not recommending it because we're not going to be using 1% of its capabilities. And the bad thing about star UML is um, uh, that it makes it very tedious to, uh, to do editing of the finer points. Let's say I want to say that, that a message has a from and a to attribute. Here I type in from and to. In a more professional system, you would right click on the thing and say, I want to have a new attribute. Then you would have to ask, answer another question or two about what kind of attribute you want and, and also what it's called. And then you would have to do it for the next attribute again, and it's just tedious. So when um, th those other systems need all that information because they want to generate code out of it. Because they have you know, it's this, this failed dream that, you know, which people really believed 15 years ago, that you could do these, draw these diagrams and then just generate all the code for your system. And then as your system changed, that they would suck it all back in and keep those diagrams and shit. I don't know of any, anyone who does, but people tried it for a while, and it, it was just too complex. So the diagrams are great um, for, for what they are, and you need to learn the notation and just keep it as simple as possible. Again, pencil and paper are perfectly fine, too, for the next homework. So in the next homework, I'm going to have you draw a couple of these diagrams. So I'm going to give you this system that's, that's maybe a little bit vaguely defined on purpose. And I'm going to say, we're going to be having a class user. And there was no class user in the mail system that's in the book. So now you're going to have to figure out, you know, does a user depend on a mailbox? Does a mailbox depend on whatever? Does a user aggregate mailboxes? Or, And I'm going to ask you for each of those uh, relationships to give a some reasoning on why you think like that. You're not going to like it. What's that? No, 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 you're, that's the thing. You're not coding it yet. It's much easier to code it, right? If it's something small like that, because you know, you know enough programming that you could probably code this thing up over a weekend. You will code it up next weekend. But if you have a large system, you can't code it up over a weekend. And it's, it's too complex. And if you make a mistake, uh, if, if you make a poor design, it's, then the cost of fixing that is very high. So the reason why that we want to come up with these designs first is to understand how to design something before coding it. And it's something that probably you've never done before. And so the first few times are definitely going to feel uncomfortable. And you know what? I've done it many times and it always feels a little uncomfortable because the code is concrete. You can look at the code and the code doesn't lie. But these diagrams are squishy. You know, people can have different opinions about should these things have relationships to the other. Remember my architect, I would say, do you really need the arrow from here to there? And he would go back to his office and ponder that question. And uh, so it takes, it, it takes some programming experience to be able to draw and talk about these diagrams. And so I want you to come up with a bunch of diagrams. And then we're all going to look at what you turn in. And they're all going to be different, I hope. Um, if, as long as you didn't do them all yourself, um, they're, they're all going to be different. And you're all going to have different reasons. And we're going to talk about some of them why some of those might be better reasons than others. So it's, a, it's more of a, like an English composition course than, than a hard coding course where you know, usually you say, well, there's you know, one optimal answer. Um, so you'll just have to give that a try to see how that feels. And I, I know it feels different. All right, so um, I have what a few more minutes. So I wanted to talk about the classes that I used in this system so that, so where am I? But, okay, um, something wrong with the slides. Let me look it up in the book. Nope, I don't want Acrobat.
All right, this is this, the picture that I want. So behold this picture here. So this is a UML class diagram of that little program that you've just seen. So you can see here what's a mailbox. We have a mailbox, and the mailbox here it says has a message, or it depends on the message view. Um, actually, I have one with it's a little bit more detailed. Here we go. So, yeah, a mailbox has two message queues. That's the new and the kept messages. You see that the message queue has messages. And that part is pretty clear. And then you see here this mail system. It's always a little risky to have a system class, but it's also often necessary. So the system holds all the mailboxes. It aggregates them. So the mail system has a collection of mailboxes. And then you see this class here called connection. What the heck is a connection? And so when you just look at the diagram, there's no way to understand from the diagram what the heck is a connection. You're actually going to have to read through this, this section. And I will want you to read through this section because when you do the homework, I'm telling you, oh, don't use a connection, but use a console. And you're going to say, what the heck is a console? And it's going to be part of your job to invent what a console is. So in this system here, one of the things that I wanted to achieve, and the diagram does not tell you that and cannot tell you that, one of the things that I wanted to achieve is to make it so that you could use this telephone class, which has a simulated telephone, with where you type in numbers 1, 2, 7, and 8 for hang up and so on, and where the messages are not spoken but printed in system. Blah, blah. So you have to simulate class. And I wanted, to, well, I wanted to make it so that you could slice away this part and put in a GUI instead. And later in chapter four or five, you will see that group. And so none of these other classes will have changed. Because none of these classes depend on what the telephone does. So it's possible to take all of these things, reuse them with zero changes, and just replace the telephone. And so that, that was a design that I wanted. So I wanted to split up the responsibilities between the, the thing that says what to do next, that drives the menuing, that remembers, and where are we right now? Because we're in this menu tree. And where in the menu tree are we? What information, like who's the current user? Who's the current mailbox? That, that kind of stuff. So the connection remembers all of that. The connection remembers what has been going on in, this, in a particular call. Now, another thing that you can think about is what in, in a, a real system of this kind has multiple connections, right? There might be so many, in the old times of physical phone connections, there would be so many connections coming into the office, and each of them would have a separate connection, but there would only be one mail system. So, um, so the thing that I want you to ponder over the weekend is have a stab at, uh, at homework too. It's not the kind of homework that you can do a day before it's due. So you have nothing better to do over Labor Day anyway. So have a look at it. And uh, when, you, when you're confused, when you have questions, put copious questions on Piazza. If you say, I have no idea how to start, say that on Piazza. Yes. Homework two is due next Wednesday. There's, there's going to be homework every week, like clockwork. So you'll never wonder when the homework is due. It's always due Wednesday. And so I'll break up everything into weekly chunks so that there's always something for you to do. Remember, I need to fill six and a half hours outside class for you. What time will we do on Wednesday? A minute before midnight. Okay, um, there was one person who wanted to see me regarding some Git issue. So Dr. Git is going to be in for a few minutes.